So this was a hard task this year just because all the speakers did such a great job and were very clear, so it didn't really need to be summarized. So I, I, I was thinking about this um, classic uh, segment from SNL where Chris Farley is interviewing uh, Sir Paul McCartney. You remember that one? Where um, he says, hey, Sir Paul, do you remember when you guys did Abbey Road and everybody thought you were dead? Said, yeah, I remember that. That was awesome. And he just keeps saying, and he just keeps saying remember this? Well, that was awesome. So I can say, hey, remember when Professor Hansen told us about the history? That was awesome. So I thought, well, OK, I can't do that. So I, I will then just give you my take on all this stuff, right, uh, and my responses to the talks. Uh, and that will be a way, I hope, of pulling it all together, or at least uh, will for me, anyway. Uh, and hopefully, it'll spark, it'll spark some, some discussion, anyway. Um, so um, is immigration good for America? Yes, up to a point, that would be my answer. And, and a lot depends on what sort of immigration and from where. Uh, and so I want to fo focus, first of all, I'm going to deal with several issues here. Uh, culture, then I want to talk about um, the rule of law, and uh, actually the order of charity and then the rule of law. Those are the three things I want to touch on. Uh, so first of all, culture. Um, culture, I think, is the thing that we need to focus on here in the immigration area. Culture is more fundamental than economics for, for three reasons, right? First of all, markets depend directly on culture. Market can't succeed without the right sort of culture. Secondly, markets depend on a political system, a legal system, which in turn depend on culture, <laughs> where culture is crucial. And the thirdly, even if that were all false, life is more than economics, right? Man does not live by bread alone. Uh, what de determines how good a society is is how well, how effectively it orders people towards the human good, uh, and that's a matter of culture. So uh, to have a great society, you need an extremely virtuous society and a moderately successful economy, I think, not the other way around. So we need to focus on, on culture predominantly. Uh, secondly, culture depends on more than mere propositional assent. This is one of my bugbears, as you know. Um, and uh, you, don't, you, know, you don't become a Christian simply by memorizing the creed. You have to take part in a liturgical, congregational kind of life. Similarly, you don't become an American simply by signing off on certain uh, propositions. I mean, every country has propositions that they believe in deeply. America does too. I believe in them, by the way. <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not a, a heretic with respect to those propositions. But they're not, they're not enough. There's more. Um, I could talk about Heidegger and Habermas and Wittgenstein and all these folks that talk about a kind of life world or a form of life that you get into. Uh, Michael Polanyi talks a lot about tacit knowledge, this knowledge of how to live, how to be an American that can't be expressed in words. It can only be picked up through, through actual shared experience. Um, and assimilation requires, I think, uh, in order to do that, a certain shared background of of worldview, of religion, of uh, historically formed practices. So, uh, so that's important. Also, I'd say that culture is also more than just feelings of gratitude, love, attachment. So I'm here responding to Jacob's uh, point earlier. Um, I mean, it's not enough just to love America. You actually have to know what it is that you love. And that it requires, again, more than just feelings. It requires kind of shared practice. And then thirdly, um, therefore, the, the assimilation to culture or the uh, adoption of culture takes time. And really, it's a multi-generational project. To become an American is to be part of something that goes beyond one's own lifetime. And therefore, um, to truly assimilate requires, uh, requires many, many generations. Um, it's more than just embracing ideas. It's entering into this, this shared practice, this shared history. Now, if all that's right, then the capacity of a community to absorb immigrants is finite. No society can do can absorb infinite numbers. I, I like to give this example to people. I say, well, suppose that we had a billion people show up tomorrow in America, and they all uh, became Americans. Could America survive that? Well, most people say, well, no, obviously not. <laughs> not if you go from 300 million to 1.3 billion, and most of these people have never been in America before. America can't survive. OK, well, then how about 900 million? Well, no, obviously not. 800 million, 10 million, 10 million, 15 million. I mean, there's a question here. There's a certain point at which the capacity for a society to absorb new people is simply overwhelmed. And what is that point? Well, Kevin Stewart, I think, introduced this, and other people have stepped on, the, uh, picked up this as well, that something around 14, 15, 16% uh, total foreign-born in America at least seems to trigger a reaction. Uh, bad things like nativism and uh, violence and things that we don't want, but, but perhaps those are um, indicating something. That there's a kind of wisdom of the crowd there that uh, the American people realize there's reason to get anxious when the number of foreign-born goes above a certain number. And of course, we're at that level now. We're above that level a bit. And as, uh, and as Susan Hansen pointed out, and, and Kevin and others have, have emphasized as well, that's combined now with a demographic crisis. 
And I think I mentioned this already, the Census Bureau predicts in 30 years, we all have a reach, reach point where we have 19% uh, foreign born, and more significantly, 34% children of, of, of foreign born, which is a total of 53% either immigrants or, or children of immigrants. Um, unprecedented levels in American history, maybe in world history. I don't know of any other country you know, short of some kind of massive invasion in which you have those kind of numbers. So if you're a conservative and you, you want to base things on, on history and actual experience, you've got to get a little nervous about whether uh, that is overwhelming our, our carrying capacities or not. Um, and of course, further worry is that these immigrants now are coming from, are, are, are more uh, religiously and culturally diverse than ever before. So it's not just massive numbers of people from England or Germany, Italy, but now from all over the world uh, who share very little in common in terms of our history and religious background. So what, what would my proposal be in response to all that? Well, I think we need to go back to the system pre-1965, have caps based on country of origin. And I propose myself that we have very generous caps for Mexico and Central America. So generous, basically, that everyone here who's here in an undocumented status could go home and come back legally, and the problem is over. <laughs> the problem in the southern border will essentially be over. And then, but extremely tight caps on the, on the rest of the world, at least, at least until we've absorbed the current uh, uh, crop of, of, of immigrants. So um, uh, that would be my proposal. And um, I've got, uh, I'll mention here, some real qualms about uh, Dr. Roberts' suggestion about a merit-based system. Uh, because it seems to me that's, that's focusing, again, exclusively on economics. And it's completely ignoring the cultural dimension. And we might, we might indeed be worse off than the status quo, despite how bad the status quo is if we went something like that. Um, I might mention here, you know, many STEM programs in the US uh, at the graduate level are 90% plus uh, foreign students. And uh, so much so that many Americans are just discouraged from pursuing those degrees because they think, I can't compete with the best from two billion, a pool of two billion uh, applicants out there, and I think that's a problem. Uh, so I, part of my proposal would be extreme restrictions on student visas as well. Uh, that's just to encourage Native Americans to uh, pursue those advanced degrees to provide us with, uh, with our scientists. Um, now what about our obligations as a wealthy country to the rest of the country? That'll move me to my second big theme here, which uh, is the one thing that Christopher in his, in his great talk left out, which is the order of charity. So I'll, I'll kind of emphasize that. Um, that is, uh, this is an idea that you find in Aquinas, actually goes back at least to Cicero, maybe earlier. The idea is that yes, we have obligations to, uh, to love our neighbor, but those obligations are proportional to how close that neighbor is to us. So we have, we have a greater obligation of charity to my own immediate family, to my local community, to my country, to the rest of the world. It's not just that I'm permitted to favor Americans over non-Americans, I'm actually required to give a higher priority to the needs of Americans than to, to the rest of the world. And I think to, to say that would be pretty shocking to most of our contemporary ethicists, and Peter Singer would have a fit <laughs> if I said that. But it seems to me that it's right. And there's several reasons why this is right. First of all, it's just natural, natural for human beings to be more concerned about those close to them. And the natural law ethics should respect what's natural for human beings. Uh, secondly, if we destroy or at least severely degrade our own country, We've also destroyed or degraded its capacity to do good to the rest of the world in the future. So we have to be good stewards of our own country if we're going to be good, uh, contribute to the good of the world, the, of the rest of the world in the long run. And with respect to immigration in particular, if we destroy our own country, then we've destroyed the very thing that the immigrants are trying to get to, right? So that would be extremely counterproductive. So we have to be good stewards of our own country. Uh, we don't need to, we shouldn't um, uh, be so uh, concerned for the needs of, of remote people that we fail to prioritize the needs of our local people. Now, uh, at the same time, this priority is not absolute, obviously. So there's also a hierarchy of needs we have to respect. If a stranger is in grave need of food uh, and it would be some minor inconvenience to my family to meet that need, then I can still have an obligation. It's not that every need of my family, no matter how slight, overrides the, the needs of a, of a stranger. So that, that certainly has to be taken into account. But at the same time, you, know, you have to exercise prudence respect to that, even, even so. Uh, I'm reminded of a biography I read of the uh, founder of the Bread for the World charity, where he was concerned about you know, getting food to people in, in poor countries, you know, desperately important thing. And the problem he faced was that every day, the, the needs of the people around the world were greater than the needs of his own family. Right? I mean, they were starving. And his own family, you know, well, his daughter wanted him to go to her, uh, her soccer game or something. Well. You know, the needs of the world always trump. And so, uh, so it was a lack of prudence on his part, I think, to think, 
you know, the greater need of those remote strangers is always going to trump this relatively modest needs of my own family. So, so even there, there's cases, I think, where what seems to be a greater need for, for people in other parts of the world may not be a strong reason for us to sacrifice our own American needs, even at a lesser level of necessity, it seems to me. Anyway, uh, so finally, um, oh, yeah, yeah, so um, one last thing about this. Um, we have an obligation, right? An obligation to do what we can for the rest of the world. Okay. So I've been emphasizing what we can. So what we can't do, right, we don't have to do. We don't have an obligation. But at the same time, we still have an obligation, I think, to also to increase our capacity to serve the needs of others, right? So in other words, the fact that we can't do everything isn't necessarily going to get us off hook entirely if we can do things to increase our own capacity in the future. So we need to be good stewards of our own economy so that it can grow in such a way that we can do more good for the rest of the world in that way. But we should also do things we can to increase our cultural capacity to be more welcoming to strangers from around the world. And then getting back to the demographic issue, we should do what we can to increase our fertility rate in such a way that we're back in the kind of situation we were in the early 20th century, big families, you know, growing population, more able then to, to welcome uh, more, more people. You might think that's hopeless, but Hungary is actually having really good success in recent years in increasing their fertility rate. It's a combination, I think, of good pro-family uh, policies, tax and employment policies, with, with a cultural message coming from the, the leaders of that country. And I think we can, we can work on that here. We can get out the message, zero population growth, that's ridiculous, right? The greatest crisis of the world today is underpopulation, not overpopulation, right? We need, we need to get that message out there. Malthusianism is absurd. Uh, and so we can do that. We need to improve our own cultural and, po and political education. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan said, every generation we're invaded by a host of barbarians, namely the young generation, right? We have to civilize them. We're doing a terrible job of civilizing the generation, that generation of, of barbarians in this country. So, um, you know, more school choice will help there, more charter schools, more private schools, uh, higher education reform, get rid of all the accrediting bodies, uh, introduce my exit exam, don't forget to stick that in there. <laughs> Various things to inform higher education to get us back on track. And, uh, you know, technology, we need to do more to help our, you know, wean our kids off the bad effects of technology. Um, uh, press these companies to give parents, to empower parents to control their kids' access better. Stamp down on internet porn somehow. I mean, look what's happened to Japan, or to our own country for that matter. Um, if you want to improve the fertility rate, you better get young men off of porn. Uh, you better get them interested in actual women. <laughs> and so that would be a big step forward. Because uh, finally, the rule of law has come up quite a bit. So I want to touch on that here in my last, my last uh, reflections. Um, you know, American culture is largely defined by the rule of law. By the fact that we make laws in certain ways and then we keep them. Um, and there are a lot of countries where it doesn't work that way. <laughs> they neither make the laws nor do they keep them. Uh, and, and it's sort of definitive of us that we do that. And what makes us American, again, is that long history, that experience we have of working together to create these laws that we live under. So this is why that respect for the law is extremely important for American culture, I think. And the, the crisis on the southern border, it is a crisis, I think, no question, uh, is a challenge to that rule of law in two ways. Right? It undermines the respect for law in two ways, I think. First of all, when you have laws that are not enforced and seen as not being enforced, that undermines the respect for the law. Of the, the, the law. And now that's where we are right now, clearly. We have these laws in the book about how many people, under what conditions people can come to this country. We have more than 10 million people here. Uh, contrary to those laws, that undermines respect for the laws. There's, there's no question about that. But there's a second way in which it undermines. And here's, here I'm going to suddenly sound like I'm on the opposite side, right? I've been very restrictionist up to this point. But the other way in which, in which our southern border undermines the respect for the law, the respect for the law is when the law is enforced in a way that's obviously inhumane and harsh and, and unfair in various ways. And I think we're there, right? Um, I mean, the people who are here, yes, they're here illegally. They, they circumvented the law. But I mean, what are they really guilty of, right? Bringing their family to a place so they can have a better life, working hard, being contributing members of communities, right? And we're treating them like criminals. And there's something bizarre about that, right? Something uh, th that creates a, a, a kind of uh, cognitive dissonance. And, and I heard that, actually, from, uh, from uh, Paul Hunker. I mean, I could tell that he felt sort of reluctant about the fact that they had to go out and round up people and deport them, right? He wasn't really happy about that. And, and, and likewise, you could hear, of course, in the obvious humanity and compassion of someone like uh, Ms. Cedillo Pereira and, 
and her uh, concern for the real impact these laws are having on, on people in this country. And I think it's hard to discount that. I'm also thinking about uh, Professor Wolf's you know, uh, suggestion that we think about the golden rule, right? How would we, well, you want to be treated in a similar kind of situation? They wouldn't want to be treated the way we're treating the immigrants here. So we need, to, we need to craft our laws in such a way that we can enforce them and do so without obvious harshness, uh, inhumanity, and so on. And that, that, I think, should be really our priority. More important than anything else uh, that we find that find a way to do that. And it seems to me you can do that without, without just throwing up our hands and saying, okay, everybody can come in, right? Uh, there, there, are, there are creative ways to do this, right? So we could, we could focus more on E-Verify and on penalizing employers, right? Rather than rounding up the employees and departing them. Why not just say, well, we're not going to do anything to the employees, but we're going we're to fine the employer. We're going to make it really costly for you to, to break the law in this way. I think that, that would come across as much less harsh. We could build better fences and walls. <laughs> uh, I think that will help, right? Because uh, that's not so harsh. I mean, there's just this really big wall, and people don't go over it, and there's the end of your story. Uh, whereas having no wall, tempting people across the border, and then crowding them into jails and doing other kinds of things, I mean, that's obviously undermining respect for law. So we need to, we need to be more creative. And of course, as, you, as I suggested earlier, more legal immigration from Mexico and Central America. Right? Let's just open the borders to that extent to a much greater degree, uh, whereas not, there's no particular reason why we have to have more immigration from Asia or Africa. They're not going to you know, swim across the Pacific Ocean, most likely, right? So, so there are ways to, to do that that don't require uh, anything very harsh. Uh, okay, I said that was the last point. I've got enough time, I think, to make one last, last point <laughs> instead, uh, and that's to introduce the, the issue of economics that I dismissed at the beginning as being unimportant. But since I've got five minutes, I'll, I'll bring it up again. Uh, what about economics? Um, so it seems to me clear, right, that massive immigration of unskilled workers is going to suppress the wages of both skilled workers here. I mean, there's just no way that can, can't be right, right, given the, the laws of small supply and demand. And, um, and like actually, I've seen studies that indicate that it especially hurts recent immigrants. So if you're interested in you know, helping promote the interests of recent immigrants, you should cut down on massive immigration, right, because they're the ones who, who suffer most from this massive uh, from, from all this uh, competition. Um, so we can't, I don't think we can just write off the working class, as Amy Wax said, and as others have pointed out, uh, that would really be contrary to the common good. We can't just say, suck it up, you know, you uh, unskilled workers in America, uh, we're gonna do the right thing instead for, for, for people around the world. Uh, and also, I, I, I'm very unsympathetic to um, proposals like the UBI, Universal Basic Income, that says, oh, don't worry, we'll just pay you uh, money so that you, you'll be fine. Um, because, the, because of the soul-destroying destro nature of that program, basically. I mean, just sit home, watch TV, and we'll send you a check, everything's fine, right? You know, who are you complaining? You're economically perfectly well off. That completely ignores the fact that work for human beings is essential for self-respect, uh, is essential for meaning, right? I mean, uh, we want to, uh, we're homo faber, we want to build things and make things, and to be told, sorry, you're redundant, but here's a check, uh, that, that's no solution. So is there any way around this? Um, well, I do think we need to have reasonably restrictive uh, immigration policy. We also need to continue down the path of our current administration, I think, of more sensible trade policy that's based on reciprocity rather than just we'll, import, we'll just import whatever, right, uh, no matter what uh, it does to our own manufacturing base. Uh, we think we need to think hard about monetary policy, right? Uh, the world has an almost insatiable desire for dollars, and um, what, we've, what we've ended up doing the last 30 years or so is we export dollars, we import everything else, uh, which is sort of okay in a way. We're living beyond our means in a sense because the rest of the world just loves our dollars, but it's destroyed our manufacturing base, right? It means that those who have access to these dollars can get all kinds of cool, cheap stuff from overseas, but the unskilled workers have nothing to do, nothing to produce because they can't compete with the world. So, you know, either we have to... Um, uh, encourage alternatives to the dollar, get the world off the dollar uh, obsession, or just flood the world with dollars, <laughs> print much more dollars than we are, uh, so, that, uh, so that we can keep demand for American manufacturing at a reasonable level and not, um, not sort of be coasting on, on, our, uh, on monetary policy alone. So um, those are my thoughts, and uh, turn it over for discussion.